So I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jesse Taylor. I work as a program advisor within the program advising department at BCIT. I look forward to telling you more about what's happening with BCIT in this virtual world uh, as the MC of this event today. I'd like to acknowledge that the British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam people. And I'm going to go over the introduction and overview or the agenda for the day. Um, so we're going to start off by having a welcome by Deborah Crawford, Associate Registrar. Uh, then we're going to come back to myself and I'm going to talk to you about full-time programs a bit more at BCIT. And then we'll hand things over to Lexi Tang from the Supervisor from Admissions uh, to, to discuss the admissions uh, procedures. And then we're going to go into a bit of detail about online learning with Carolyn Depetit, the Associate Dean of Business Administration uh, from the School of Business and Media. And then on to trades learning with Sanya Boscovich, Associate Dean of Aerospace at the Aerospace Technology Campus. And then we're going to talk about student access and well-being uh, with Michael Mandrusiak, Associate Director of Student Access and Well-Being. And then we're going to go into a few minutes uh, to cover prizes uh, and then come back uh, to hear from Carol Martina, who's the coordinator for high school partnerships and dual credit. So we can hear a bit more about that. And then we'll have our question and answer period at the end of the session. With that, I'd like to hand things over to Deborah Crawford to welcome us this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your morning with us today, whether that be from your home or from your workplace. And as I work from my home in the Tri-Cities, I would like to acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional lands of the Coquitlam First Nation. So thank goodness for technology, right? Technology that uh, ensures we can still meet and learn and work and do business during a time like this. The world is learning and we are learning. <laughs> I'm learning more than anyone. When I think about the amount of learning that has occurred in the past seven months, not just for me or BCIT, but in the province and the country and around the world, it's really quite mind blowing. And then I think about how in the midst of what may be the greatest period of adjustment we'll see in our lifetimes, high school students are learning. Not only their high school subjects, but they're learning about change and resiliency, about communication and compassion, about leadership, and they're learning about themselves. But they're also learning about possibilities. In a way, the very reason that keeps us physically apart today is the same reason that these students might be more prepared, agile and resilient than we are as they take the next steps in their education. At BCIT, our mission is partnering learners and industry for success through workplace development. And we recognize our role in the province's economic recovery. Today, you'll hear from a number of my colleagues, each of whom in their own specialized roles is contributing to the development of our future workforce. BCIT has long been known as the place to go for applied learning, and that really hasn't changed. Sure, we've made some adjustments to the way we teach and support, and some of these adjustments might just be so successful that they form part of our new normal. Today, we're pleased to share with you a look at BCIT programming, how we've adapted, and how we're supporting our students. And we know that as high school educators, you have adapted too. And we know that you may have questions about that, and we want to make sure that your students can still access and be successful in getting the education they want. So while our program today is condensed, we are leaving lots of time to connect and answer your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you'll enjoy the session and that we see each other and your students soon. Back to you, Jesse. Thanks very much, Deborah. All right, whoops, skipped a slide there. So this morning, we have you here to talk about BCIT, uh, where we have over 50,000 students that choose BCIT each year. Um, and at the core of BCIT, things have continued largely as they always have with our faculty working closely with industry, delivering training, providing expert advice, and helping to bring ideas to market. Students learn with a, within a small classroom setting with their cohort, cohort of classmates from instructors with strong industry connections. Employers recognize the efforts that go into achieving B, a BCIT credential, and they know that our focus is to strive to have graduates that are job ready. And now let's talk about program areas at BCIT. So the first area that we have is the Applied and Natural Sciences, uh, which has over 30 programs. 
the majority of these programs are first qualified, first accepted for entry and with a range of requirements. So it's especially important to have students take the time to review the details outlined on the program's pages and select a program that suits their needs. Exciting career paths await in jobs such as becoming a sustainable resource manager, a nautical sciences officer, public health inspector, or even a provincial park ranger, or perhaps a future in forensic science is what your students will seek out. On to business and media. So with most programs in this sector uh, requiring a 67% minimum in pre-calculus 11 as well as English 12, it offers a lot of great opportunities and I myself am a proud school business graduate. So I came to BCIT, attended uh, business operations management and then switched over to graduate from business management in the second year. Um, one program area that I'd like to mention that has made a change for the coming year is marketing management. Previously, this program area would accept applications directly towards tourism, entrepreneurship, sales, or the competitive entry option of communications. Now, the program will accept for a common first year and then proceed with the selection process prior to the second year with students providing their top choices as they transition from first year to second year. As well, the School of Business has the largest concentration of international students at BCIT. Our International Student Center provides assistance to international applicants specific to maintaining their visa requirements, connecting with new students over the phone, and having early discussions to clarify postgraduate work permits. I referenced their page here in case any of your students may wish to contact their department directly uh, to gain additional assistance. Please also note that some of the photos included within these slides do represent pre-COVID classroom settings. Um, so you can see these two are sitting very close to each other without any protection. And, and that could just simply be because they're part of each other's bubble. But I just wanted to reference that and make comment to it. On to the School of Computing and IT at BCIT. So again, another area that we have over 30 different applied programs with a reputation for job-ready graduates. Though many of the programs accept on a first qualified basis, it's often the competitive entry programs that stand out. Um, there are those that apply and gain acceptance. And usually if they are getting acceptance, some of the competitive programs will have them achieving high 80s or even in the 90s uh, for their grades in English 12 and pre-calculus pre 12. So this applies to programs such as computer information technology and computer systems technology. Also offered in this area of study is the newer Industrial Network Cybersecurity Program, which is really exciting, and it's the first of its kind in Canada. And over to engineering. So there's many different programs that are offered within the School of Engineering. Uh, we are the main provider of programs such as industrial instrumentation, uh, mill rate, as well as power engineering programs in British Columbia. We have our fully accredited Bachelor of Engineering programs in areas like civil engineering, electrical, mechanical, and mining, as well as master's degrees in building science or a master's degree in building science. So for the first qualified options from this area, it's important to have students apply early to secure a seat for their program. And for competitive options, it's best that the students uh, reference the preference that are outlined on the program page and make sure that they've reviewed them in full and that they strive for strong academics to apply with and compete for acceptance. And certainly reach out to us in the program advising department to get additional tips. On to health sciences. So the health sciences area offers many competitive entry programs with numerous diagnostic programs and strong employment opportunities. So some of these programs will require additional studies after high school in order to pursue them, such as the nursing program, and there's also been some changes uh, within the requirements for a specific program with medical radiography. And this program now requires post-secondary credits uh, prior to applying, so similar to the nursing program. This program is also moving to a January intake uh, from a September intake. And the opposite is the case with medical laboratory science, which was a January intake and will be switching to a September intake. So those are important to note. Most of these programs are completed in two years and research into the role of the technologist can be important as students consider one of the many competitive options. So definitely research is key. On to oops, the final area, uh, which is trades, technical and apprenticeship programs. So as we've adjusted classes to make them safe to attend, some programs have had their intakes changed. 
So it's important to contact us and clarify the intake dates as a result of this. There are a few programs with longer wait lists at the moment. So programs such as heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration, or HVAC, uh, and its acronym, uh, for the diploma. So that would uh, require a new applicant to apply as soon as possible, make sure that they meet the requirements, um, and then they're likely looking at uh, 2022. Uh, the same would apply to airport operations and the automotive technician certificate program uh, for the standard option. So there are many programs available. However, early applications are encouraged, regardless of the program of pursuit. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to Lexi Tang within the admissions department uh, to talk to you about admissions processes. Hello everyone, I'm glad and honored to join this event passing uh, representing BCIT's admissions team to share some information with high school educators here today. Uh, next the slides please. This page currently showing here is a screenshot of a program landing page or you can call it a program homepage for one of our programs, full-time accounting diploma program. In the past years, we have heard from counselors that they want to see some improvements on our BCIT website. While that is well received, at the end of November, the site will have a brand new look, modernized and fresher look, it will be more user-friendly and mobile-friendly, so please stay tuned. On the right-hand side of this program landing page, there are several tabs with excellent resources, including overview for a brief introduction to the program, cost and supplies for estimated cost, courses to find out what courses will be offered in this program, program details, graduation and jobs, and much more. I would like to highlight one of the tabs that you may be interested in the most, the program entry page or the entrance requirements page. This is where you will find information regarding the entrance requirements as well as application submission deadline dates. It will also tell you if a program is a competitive, non-competitive or trace entry program. You may take non-competitive entry program as a first qualified, first accepted program. And of course, as long as you meet the minimum entrance requirement and as long as there are seats available. As you may see on this accountant diploma program landing page, this is a non-competitive entry program. Most of these programs have opened to accept applications for the fall 2021 as of October 1st this year. Some early applicants have already submitted their applications and even have received their full acceptance within a few weeks of their application submission date. Competitive entry means you may need higher grades to be considered for a seat into the program or even need some post-secondary courses or work experience to get in. Like my coworker Jesse just mentioned, we always recommend you to connect with the program advisor for advice if your program of interest follows a competitive entry model. Most trace programs are accepting applications on an ongoing basis year round with the waitlisting system. Seats are offered to waitlisted applicants once available. Now, if you have gone through all of the tabs above and still have questions, you can click on the very last tab on the right hand side, contact us. Most of the time you will be connecting with the program advisor. So let's move on to our admissions process. Preparing your application is fairly easy for high school applicants. I have listed the link to a step-by-step -step guide on our admissions site. Currently, any high school applicants can meet the entrance requirements with one of the following three ways showing on this page, unless stated otherwise on the program's landing page. When you see a program is asking for a grade 12 course, that your students haven't started taking it or in the process of completing it, they can use the proof of registration in the grade 12 course plus their grade 11 final grade to meet the interest requirement. Especially now, many schools are in the new quarterly system. This measure does not disadvantage any high school applicants and allows them to receive an early full acceptance. If your student wants to apply at a later date, they can use their midterm grade of the required grade 12 course. And the third option is to apply using their final grade for their grade 12 course, which most of them wouldn't have at this moment. I also have some application tips to share with you. 
Once you have checked out the program landing page and find it is a non-competitive program, get started sooner than later and apply using the grade 11 final plus proof of registration in the grade 12 course. Same for trace programs. Applying early will ensure that you get your priority in the wait list. For some counselors who want to learn more about the English language proficiency test acceptable at BCIT, I have provided the direct link here. We accept a lot of test results such as TOEFL, IELTS, KALE, and the temporary measure of Duolingo English test, and etc. Different test grades are required to meet different English entrance requirements for each unique program. After learning all above, now you might be ready to apply. Next slide, please. Now you can see a five-step application process in front of you. A few things to note. Applicants must meet the minimum requirements for the program to be considered. And please do remember, at BCIT, each program has its own unique entrance requirements to ensure students' academic success. So make sure you check it out before you get started. When you are preparing for the application, click on the Apply Now button on the program landing page, and new users will be asked to create a BCIT ID. When you're creating the profile with BCIT, you'll be asked to fill a few questions for data collection purposes. For example, you will see a question about the highest level of education and what is the last year of your attendance. High school applicants can select high school in progress and put in the current year 2020 as the last year of their attendance. And of course, in the next year, it will become 2021. It will also ask a question about their English language proficiency and high school applicants can easily select I am currently taking English 12 in a Canadian high school as their answer. Then they will need to prepare all supporting documents such as high school transcript and a grade 12 timetable as the proof of registration and convert them into PDFs to be used in the next step, submitting the online application. During this process, applicants will be asked to self-declare how they meet each of the entrance requirements, uploading their supporting documents, and pay for their application fee with the credit card. BCIT then will send updates and official correspondence through the same portal, my.bcit.ca. It is strongly recommended that all applicants check it out regularly during their application process. Applicants will hear their first update within one to two weeks and may receive an offer for a non-competitive program in as short as a couple of weeks. The processing time for competitive programs may be a little bit longer. Offers are generally made a few weeks after the application submission deadline. In the next slide, I would like to feature the program availability page on admissions .bc, uh, on bcit.ca slash admissions, which is a great tool for counselors to find out which programs are open to accept applications or waitlisting. It is a, uh, and also its program delivery modes such as online or blended, the start date, and a lot more at a quick glance. The information on this page is dynamic. So feel free to use the search bar to find out what you need. Hope all these will help you to support your students in their application process and also wish you a productive and wonderful year despite the pandemic. Thank you all and I will pass it back to Jesse now. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm coming to you from the beautiful territories of Squamish uh, where I live. Um, I've certainly been enjoying it a little bit less commute over the, <laughs> since March. I've um, been working from home a lot, but do go on campus once in a while. So I'm here today. My name is Caroline Depetsi. I'm an associate dean uh, for business administration, which is a department within the School of Business and Media. And I'm here today um, to take about 10 minutes of your time. And I will start my uh, clock just to make sure that I stay on time to talk to you about online learning. The original topic was tech learning and then we changed it to online learning because I'm not really an IT person. Um, I come, uh, my background is as an educator and I certainly have a lot to say about online learning. It's been um, 
you know, like all educator, I think around the world, around Canada, around the province, it's been quite, um, uh, you know, the learning curve for all of us uh, since March. So, uh, Jesse, I'm just going to ask you to move forward the slide, please. Thank you. So I'll just give you very uh, quick general uh, landscape at BCIT uh, regarding online learning. And then I'm going to move into more what we're doing in the School of Business and Media, because that's where I live and I reside and, and I know uh, more about. But uh, majority of our programs and courses have been online since mid-March. Um, I was in a, in a presentation yesterday. They were saying there's around 3,000 uh, students on a, on a weekly basis that do come to campus. And I think Sonia is going to talk to you a little bit more uh, about trades programs. We do have some programs in business like broadcast and uh, media that are delivered face-to-face -face. and obviously anything that's delivered on campus has very clear pandemic safety protocol in place. That's been a huge focus of our work uh, over the summer and in and, and, and the fall. So winter 2021 will remain as is. We will deliver uh, still in the School of Business and other schools a lot, uh, the majority of our program uh, online. Uh, we're not too sure what's going to happen after. Uh, and I think Michael's going to come in and talk a little bit more about increased services or, or, and other people regarding there's been increased services. And I think everybody has done a really good job and able to, uh, and to support students that um, in the online uh, sphere. So you'll hear, a little, you'll hear a little bit more about that later. For us in the School of Business, and I'm assuming in other school, other faculty, um, we're starting to think post-pandemic delivery. What what can we learn from this? And I think that's really important. We've uh, experienced, uh, you know, we've learned a lot. We keep, keep on growing and we're now thinking, what is it going to look like um, afterwards? So we're starting to be uh, do a little bit of that work. So if you can move, thank you. Um, you can probably just put the four focus right away. <laughs> Thank you. One of the key thing was for us in the School of Business was really to focus on 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 what we do and not deviate too much in this online in online sphere uh, or landscape and keep on thinking. Okay, how do we keep on achieving our course learning outcomes in an online environment? That's really really important. And we may have to change things like our, assess, our assessment process and, and, and different things for sure. But at, at the core is let's meet our course learning outcome because that's what we uh, promised uh, the, the student through our deliveries. Student success and engagement was really important. Like we want students to be successful. There's various challenges that they're going through, obviously learning at a distance and engagement. We want students to still be engaged, to be able to um, share with their instructors, share with themselves and not just sit there as a participant as, as many of us do when we're on Zoom calls or, or so on. We kind of just sit there and do all sorts of other things. And, 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 and how do we keep the students really engaged in that process, which is really important. Strong industry connection. This is really a mandate of uh, the institution. So how the institute, so how can we keep the strong industry connection? And I'll show you an example in a second through our online learning. This is really important. We, our mandate is really to get students ready for the workforce and we want them to work after they leave BCIT. So maintaining these industry connections are pretty crucial. Preparing students for a change workforce. Um, you know, I've heard different things around people saying, oh, students should, you know, maybe wait it out, not go to school. It's all online. What's going to happen? I think this is a disservice to, um, to students because uh, the workforce has changed, especially in business, and students will have to be able to work online. We all know, you know, we're not sure how this is going to look like, who's going to go back to their offices or not. But a, a lot of businesses have really changed the way that they do things. So coming to school first, you know, to be immersed um, in that online environment right now it is great because it really prepares them for what's going to happen in, in the workforce. For example, we teach our students a lot about working with virtual teams. So how can you be efficient uh, when working on a project virtually? So you can move to the next slide, please. So this is a picture. Recently, we had um, engagement with uh, engagement in industry. Uh, Charlotte, which is the instructor at uh, the top corner there, teaches an entrepreneurship course, and she brought students in the industry together on Zoom uh, for students to uh, it was a pitch about a business idea that they were doing. I think they had like five minutes to do that. And then our industry experts, which was um, which were involved in this meeting, would then give feedback directly to the students. So this was a great way, again, to have that engagement, to have industry connection, 
through some of our coursework. So this is just one of the examples. So if you wanna move forward, please. What we're hearing from students, uh, learning has not been compromised with online delivery. They're, most of them are really enjoying it. Uh, students are enjoying having less commuting time, <laughs> just like me, I said at the beginning. Uh, they do like the synchronous delivery and con connecting with instructors and classmates live. That's really important. We, you know, we weren't sure at the beginning, synchronous, asynchronous. So I think the best approach that we're finding is a, is a blend approach. Having students spend 20 hours a week, because, uh, you know, at BCIT, um, there's lots of uh, lecture and lab, especially in, in our business school and other programs around BCIT. It's quite intense in hours of instruction. So being in front of a computer for 20, 25, 30 hours a week is a little bit much uh, in a synchronous way. So we're just finding that the blend of delivery um, is probably, uh, you know, the best way to go. But again, students really like uh, the synchronous piece and having that opportunity to connect. Uh, students are saying they want to be back on campus for face-to-face -face delivery, but also wouldn't mind continuing some possible online delivery, either synchronously or asynchronously in some courses. So we're, who knows what that's going to look like, but that's definitely what we're hearing. And we're also hearing, and I think that's going to come back a little bit in the section on, on health and, and how we're supporting students, that uh, students are really missing the social aspect of being on campus. And some are challenged by the, by the isolation, um, uh, you know, with their environment that they have to be uh, studying, study, that they're studying in and so on. So we, um, we're, we're really aware of that piece. Okay, if you want to move, please. Thank you. So examples of initiatives that we've done through our online learning, we kind of started out really early in March saying, hey, we need to adopt a kinder and gentler approach here. Nobody asked for this. Um, this pandemic is challenging for everybody in different ways. So let's kind of be kind and gentle to ourselves and with our students. We did some changes to our first year programs in the School of Business. We deliver a lot of courses and a lot of credits, and we thought this is going to be too much for students to take all these courses at the same time. So we um, condensed some courses so students take less course at a time, but in a more intense uh, way. We developed uh, in the School of Business a social media application called the Spot, which is in pilot uh, this term, where students can connect uh, socially. Um, with their group, their peers that they're studying with, um, although we're finding that they're using the spot, but also their traditional uh, social media sites. We uh, did encourage instructors to have pre-recorded lectures. What we're finding now in this online space is that students prefer small uh, lectures, pre-recorded lectures, so instead of having an instructor speak for an hour, they like kind of maybe three videos of 20 minutes <laughs> versus like the full hour so that they can um, listen in chunks. So this is definitely feedback that we're uh, getting with the asynchronous delivery um, or, or, or related to pre-recorded uh, pre lectures. Um, we do have synchronous activity in our area. We have what we call lab. So let's say that we have an econ course. We'll have an hour lecture that's often will be pre-recorded. And then the students will meet in a virtual classroom or a Zoom um, setting to do the applied work with their instructors and, and their um, classmates. Okay, so we'll move forward. Jesse, please, thank you. Um, example of initiatives, others we do use in our either Zoom or it's a it's called Bongo, which is related to virtual classroom, which is linked to our learning hub, which I'll talk a little bit in a few minutes here. Um, I'm just checking my time. I think I'm okay here. Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, we have breakout room polling question, whiteboards, um, assessments. We're looking at smaller and more frequent assessment. We have set up e-learning champion student peers program and um, try to get as much interactive device uh, available to our instructors as we can. Uh, next slide. I have two more slides left. So I might go like a minute over. Sorry, Sonia. I know you're, <laughs> you're, you're next. Um, I just want to talk a bit about a learning hub, which is really our on online course support. In the past, uh, when we delivered face-to-face, -face, this was used as a supplemental site where instructors would post their notes, would have maybe online discussions and different things, use the, the, the calendar. But now, really, the learning hub is becoming our teaching platform. 
uh, where every course that a student takes at BCAT has a learning hub attached. And this is where they could meet with their instructors if they if the instructor chooses uh, so. This is where the um, virtual classroom sits in. Um, you can see there I kind of brought back the activity under virtual classroom. And this is where, again, we can organize to po post some recorded lectures or have our synchronous um, uh, classes and so on. I just mentioned that we can have our quizzes in there. So this is really our main tool. Next slide, please, Jesse. Thank you. I just wanted to add in the Learning Hub, we have functions like daily, we can put weekly news. I know in the classes, I teach one class and I, I, I post twice a week, you know, a news to, with my students. And this is how we can connect with them and everything's on one site. Uh, you can have your quiz statistics. So you can take a quiz online, enter your marks, or it auto marks for you. And then right away, you will have your statistics. So students have access to this data. Uh, we also have, if you if instructors are using the virtual classroom within the learning hub, we can have attendance uh, statistics. Oh, sorry, I thought I blocked off uh, the name of my students there, but two are still showing. Um, which is fine, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll pay more attention to that next time. And uh, we can see how, how many minutes students have attended and the chat count, because we do have a chat here. Chat count of one, two, three is maybe a little bit low. We expect more. I know in my classes that are very interactive for students that at least participate in the chat 10 to 15 times during a, let's say, a, a one and a half hour to two hour meetup. So these are all kind of tools that we're using within the learning hub. And you can go to the last slide, Jesse. Um, this is it. I just want to thank you. Uh, again, this was my perspective, what we're seeing in the School of Business. I think it's kind of can can spill over to other areas uh, of the Institute. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. If anybody wants to contact me, if you have further questions, please feel free to email me. And I will pass it on to Sonia, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Awesome. I think you did a great job explaining in a short time uh, what uh, was accomplished, you know, in a pretty much no time over the, over the night. Uh, thank you, everybody, for um, joining us, and thank you for having me. It's such a great pleasure, you know, always to share what uh, BCIT as a community, as an educational institution, what we're doing and how we're basically walking the talk. And uh, when I said walking the talk, that's exactly what was happening in the last eight months. We learned a lot. And uh, we were learning together with the students. And how we did that, we did that, as Caroline said, with uh, just those three words, stay calm, stay kind. And, uh, you know, last piece was actually implemented in, uh, in my area, um, stay safe. So uh, opposing, you know, the, the Caroline situation, I've been at the campus almost uh, from the March. So the reason is uh, obviously with the trades and technology areas, and you know that uh, uh, we have a lot of hands-on, uh, you know, skills, hands-on uh, activities that we are obligated and uh, we promised, and that's our bread and butter to deliver to our students. So we converted everything online now with the all great tools that Caroline explained uh, with uh, synchronize and synchronize, uh, you know, with um, recorded, you know, sessions with even recorded just a small, you know, PowerPoints with the major point with the, you know, uh, voice so that the students actually can uh, uh, review that anytime, any place on any device. Uh, we put all the, you know, softwares and everything on the cloud so the students actually connect with that. But with the uh, uh, technology and trades area, you need to have to be on a campus. So, Jesse, could you please uh, give me the, another uh, slide? So we needed, it was a mandatory to bring students to campus. And uh, we call that delivering blended model. You know, it's not just blended with the synchronized and synchronized as the Caroline explained, but it's also blended model we needed to deliver and if everything that could be delivered, we needed to deliver online so that we decrease the number of students on the campus. And you know that better than all of us in the high school and uh, even elementary school uh, system where uh, your bubble is supposed to be small. You need to have the low number of the students flowing. You need the low number of the faculty. So all these pieces were actually in a way to keep everybody safe and yet to deliver the 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 uh, what we need to deliver 
So what uh, uh, is uh, uh, and how the model looks like? You know, uh, all our programs, pretty much all our programs are in a trade and technology area. It's about 50, 60, 70 percent, you know, depends on the theory and then 50 or up, uh, lower to the 30 percent on uh, uh, campus with uh, different shops, different labs and so on. So we decide, okay, we will deliver everything online that it could be uh, delivered online with the theory. And even with the practical piece, using, uh, you know, amazing educational technology, virtual, uh, 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 you know, things uh, uh, with uh, uh, different uh, uh, simulation, uh, different uh, um, HoloLens, and, and anything that students can actually do at home, prepare them when they come to uh, uh, a campus that, uh, and when the campus was read, uh, is ready, and campus was ready, uh, most of the campuses uh, uh, or classes were ready in uh, August. Some of them very early, like in, you will see in a carpentry automotive in in a May June. We needed to prepare them when they come, that they will actually spend quality time on uh, you know developing the skills that they need to develop for the uh, field they choose. So <clears throat> that includes, you know, little animations. I, unfortunately, we couldn't do that, but on a, on a screen on your left side, you will see that uh, distance and everything that we wanted to implement. And uh, when uh, the first testing, and I can talk about uh, ATC, the airspace uh, campus, uh, when the first testing happened on a campus, I think that was the one of the uh, uh, happiest date uh, in 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 our uh, in our time from March, so we brought the students to the campus. But you know, in order to prepare them because they haven't been, it's an all new situation, anxiety level very high. Um, you know, safety things. Uh, 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 you know, how the things are going to go. Am I going to be safe? How long I'm going to stay? So we develop a little clip. You know, and uh, with a little clip and animation, students will actually be informed uh, when they need to come, how they're going to behave, what they need, uh, need to, to, to have, how the test is going to look like, and so on. So we wanted to prepare them so when they come that there is no loss of time. So this is efficiency and effectiveness that we developed through this process was absolutely amazing. And everybody from, you know, all logistics at the BCIT to our absolutely amazing team of learning and teaching, you know, people that, you know, uh, uh, taught us how to use that instructional development, you know, in uh, preparation for uh, students was absolutely absolutely crucial. Can I have a next slide, please? So when they, you know, finish and we prepare all the labs, now we need to, to bring the students uh, to, to labs, but still, you know, we want to follow all the, you know, advices that uh, our uh, 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 safety officer actually asked us to do. And then we needed to be really careful that we follow that pyramid. And I'm pretty sure everybody's just now uh, aware of that pyramid, what is on the top, what is at the, at the bottom, right? And how we need to start. And the, the primary thing was to keep the distance. Then if it's not uh, 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 in a place, then uh, go with the PPE. Then if it's not in a place that do the, uh, uh, you know, different barriers, different uh, uh, safety measurements implementing, implement the different safety measurements. So all these things are really easy to, to say than to do it, right? Oh, we will do this, we will do that. And everything is in a place and you look at on, on your right and left uh, uh, screen, especially on your left screen, everything is perfect. You know, it's a distance, it's a clean, it, all signage in, it, it, uh, are in. Now the students are coming, but we needed to prepare them. So we ask, you know, students to complete all the, every single student, as well as every single employee coming back to campus, they needed to complete the, the uh, COVID, the little COVID the course. And uh, that will actually show us that uh, they understand the, the, how this situation is serious and how all of us need to be on the same page following these safety protocols, because only keeping that in mind, keeping that, you know, habit, it's kind of habit now, it's a culture that you're developing completely new, it's gonna, you know, allow us to, to keep our doors open.
because um, you know any single outbreak can actually cause the, the closing the campus. Fortunately, we are still uh, uh, having about um, 142 programs. You know, 142 programs at BCIT having, uh, you know, labs, different labs and shops. And that includes, and Caroline says, about 3,000 students. At ATC, I can say that and at any point in time at the campus, I have about 120 students in a different labs and shops. And we need all to work really hard, including students, to keep them, keep them safe. So all signages are on the floor or signages are on the, on the walls. And if, you know, two meters is not uh, uh, applicable because sometimes it's not applicable. And in a way that, you know, it's a, it's an engine. Let's say they're working on a, on a, a PD6 engine, but that's a heavy thing. They cannot move it by themselves. They need to work in a, in a, in a pairs. And that brings them, you know, to moment that they will understand how the, they're going to work in industry. And they're going to work in industry with the people. So they need to be aware what uh, uh, safety measurements they need to have in order to keep themselves safe and keep, keep others safe. And you can see, you know, innovative things. Obviously, we needed to come up with the things that how to come close. We want to keep that chemistry, right, between our students and, and faculty members and the campus. So how to bring that and yet keep, keep everybody safe. So on the right um, side of this uh, slide, you can see how faculty member is, uh, you know, separated <laughs> from students with that plastic things. I think we all now hate that plastic things and uh, uh, barriers and everything. And at such a point, because they're so dividing us. But you know what? They're keeping us safe. So it's a clear, you know, plastic divider that um, the students can actually see the demonstration. This is the one of the uh, way how we are delivering, you know, and, and demonstrating the, the, uh, the things. Another one, obviously, we can record that. The third one is also uh, in a way of using the um, spy glasses. So that's a really interesting approach of one of our faculties in, a, in, a, in our trades area. Uh, using the, the spy glasses with the camera, so faculty member actually can see that and students can actually receive that through the Bluetooth to their iPhones. Amazing way of using uh, technology and converting that into educational technology. I really don't think so that spy glasses are meant to be for uh, educational technology, but uh, we just found a way, our faculty members found a way to actually uh, use it. So, or just on a selfie, you know, that stick, the faculty will actually uh, have the, the, the iPhone and iPhone connected, you know, to the screen to actually demonstrate how other students are doing and uh, guiding them to, to keep the distance, keep the safety, uh, all measurements in a place and deliver the, the, the education. Because keep in mind, and uh, we all have uh, our understanding of this and, and, and normal time, unprecedented time, but education has to go on, right? Uh, one way or, or another. And the best way that we are finding at, at BCIT, which, you know, online delivering was not unknown for BCIT, but not in this massive, massive way, you know, and uh, keeping the quality and yet not lose the, you know, that uh, very important uh, piece of uh, delivering hands on. Uh, hands-on skills. Can I have another slide, please? So all approach that we have of a delivering that 50% or 30% of the uh, hands-on uh, uh, skills in the trades and technology were actually done with the following protocols, following the, the uh, uh, provincial uh, uh, health officer. And we really, really needed to... Uh, 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 Educate. This is a piece important. Putting the, the uh, those um, safety measurements was not easy. I cannot say that because you know that in your schools and you know in 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 an in environment. But educating students, educated ourselves that it's a new way of a new normal way of delivering with the mask, recognizing advising, uh, looking students, you know, even though they're 
adult, there are students and we are looking after, after them. And you know what? They started then looking after us because I sometimes, it's in my environment. This is my bubble, right? I would go out from my office without mask. And then they will actually look at me and say, mm, where is the mask? So I'm putting the mask on immediately and saying, yes, you're right. So developing that, it's a really important key. And uh, I'm pretty sure you guys are doing a great job in, uh, in post-secondary education now. Now, we were in this first, you know, way we did it uh, on, on our own because we didn't have the students coming from uh, that environment. Uh, for your uh, uh, information, please uh, watch a couple of our videos. We have more and more going on and how we're doing a, a great job, you know, at DCIT to deliver those skills. Uh, what are we just paying attention? Paying attention on learning outcomes. So whatever was delivered maybe previously in the six hours, we're delivering in the four hours to keep students safe and not keep them on the campus too long. But we're delivering the learning outcomes and our efficiency and effectiveness. It's coming to the really high point. And I think I uh, did my uh, 10 minutes. Maybe I have a couple more minutes uh, uh, just if you have any questions or anything. Uh, uh, otherwise, I will pass uh, the, the torch to Michael and the uh, absolutely important thing, student uh, success and how we are all supporting students to be successful in this very tough time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Sonia. I really appreciate that. And hello, everybody. My name is Michael Mandruziak. I'm the Associate Director of Student Access and Wellbeing. Um, so I work with um, health counseling and accessibility services here at BCIT, and I'm also going to be speaking on behalf of my colleague Robin Bennett uh, in the Student Life Office, and we all fall under the umbrella of student success here at, at BCIT. Um, just for those of you who are wondering, I'm not wearing a beanie cap, I've got a ceiling fan in the background, but it's, it, it, it is the angle that I have here. Um, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to join you for uh, the, the questions at the end, but you, if there's a few questions, I may be able to answer them during the presentation. Otherwise, I will leave my contact information at the end and would be happy to, uh, to, to respond to any people that way as, as well. So uh, just going to talk a little bit about student success and, and supporting students. Uh, if Jesse, if I could get the, the next slide, great. Uh, what, what we hear when we talk with high school educators uh, is that they often are struck by the leap in responsibility from uh, high school to, to post-secondary that, that's kind of expected of students. So the, the change in expectation of uh, students. And in high school, there's uh, less freedom, but there's also less, fewer responsibilities that, that students have. Uh, and in college or, or post-secondary, uh, students have more freedom, but that comes with more responsibility, more expectations on them. Um, as well, in, in high school, there's more in-class direct learning, uh, whereas in college, there's more out-of-class independent learning. So again, there's more responsibility on the learner uh, to be structuring and managing their time and particularly kind of in the circumstances we're in right now with with more remote learning uh, that can add kind of additional uh, pressures and expectations related to time management and organization of, of learning. Um, in, this is kind of an important piece related to supporting students that in high school, maybe it's more likely that a student, uh, a teacher may approach a student who, who needs help and so that if the student's passive in seeking uh, help that may be okay. Uh, whereas in post-secondary, uh, there's an expectation generally that a student will be a little bit more active in identifying when they need help. So the, the help and supports are there and available to them, um, but, but they may need to play a more active role in identifying if they need help from an instructor or if, if, if they're wanting to receive other supports and, and services. Um, uh, kind of a, along the way. So uh, I, I, I think the, the thing that we would want maybe uh, high school educators to know uh, and to be helping to prepare students for 
um, is is that is that just to, if the students are needing help, just that awareness that that help is available to them, and we're going to be talk, talking a little bit more about what kinds of help are available, uh, but they may need to identify that they're needing uh that help and and we do recognize that support is important um if students are going to grow they need to be challenged and that challenge can be stressful uh so, so for, for it to be successful in in translating into growth the, the support needs to be there uh okay if we can go to the next slide uh, we we do know, uh, and this this is uh, I'm going to share a little bit of data that's uh, not specific to BCIT. It, it's from the National College Health Assessment, uh, the Canadian Reference Group. So for can, um, for all Canadian post secondary uh, uh, students in post secondary in Canada uh, do report distress in having a di difficult time handling kind of a range of things. And these were some of the top things that that the most common things that students reported distress. Uh, related to or difficulty handling in the past 12 months. Uh, and this is actually data, I think I'd updated, it says 2016 there, but I, I believe it's 2019 data. Um, the academics, uh, students did report kind of in the last uh, 12 months that academics was a source of distress um, uh, or was difficult to handle for them, uh, followed by finances. So a lot of students of uh, almost 44% reporting uh, stress related to finances. Uh, some of that translated into sleep difficulties with over 40% of students uh, talking about difficulties with sleep. Uh, personal appearance uh, was one actually a, a cohort of students who I was talking to once said was surprising to them, but perhaps not surprising if you think about this as a time of identity development and also a time where uh, students may be pursuing intimate relationships, uh, that uh, personal appearance was kind of a, a source of distress for, for a sizable uh, portion of students, as well as career, family, and intimate relationships uh, being areas where they reported distress or, or having difficulty handling in the last 12 months. Uh, and that does translate into kind of a, an impact on, on students. Uh, Jesse, if we could go to the next slide. Um, with in the last 12 months, um, and from the same source, 2019, Canadian post-secondary students, 88.2% reporting that they were overwhelmed with all that had to be done at some point in the past 12 months. 51.6% uh, of Canadian post-secondary students saying that at some point in the 12, past 12 months, they felt so depressed it was difficult to function. 68.9% um, reporting that they felt overwhelmed with anxiety at some point uh, in those 12 months. Uh, and 87.6% saying they felt exhausted. 69.6% saying they felt lonely at some point in the past 12 months. Uh, one thing that's, that's maybe important to point out there is that uh, when we're talking about those numbers, that doesn't represent disorder. That's just telling us that those experiences are common. Um, when 88.2% of people are saying something, that 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 means it's, it's that experience at some point, um, and it may be a transient experience. It doesn't tell us about duration, but that that, that is a, a common experience of students in Canadian post secondary at some point. And so, it just points that that uh, that to help students to thrive, they may they may need support at at those times when they're they're experiencing some of those things. Um, okay, so so maybe if we can move on. So at at BCIT. Um, we actually just recently launched the Student Wellbeing and Resilience Framework, which, which is, uh, uh, I guess, a demonstration of our commitment to, to student well-being and to supporting students. Uh, and, and that framework follows the a model called the Eight Dimensions of Wellbeing, which really rec recognizes that uh, well-being com uh, is a holistic uh, thing that comprises various different intersecting dimensions uh, and and difficulties in any one dimension can impact a person's well-being and health in in other dimensions as well so uh, if, if you have a student who's struggling with finances uh, and housing uh, that's probably going to have an impact on their their uh, ability to learn and grow kind of in terms of their intellectual well-being uh, and if you have a student who's lonely and isolated uh, th that probably is going to have an impact on their psychological health uh, and well-being and so all these dimensions of well-being are interconnected and you really have to look at supporting 
uh, students across the spectrum of, of those dimensions of well-being. And that's what our student services are for. And so uh, we do have a, a landing page, bcit.ca slash forward slash student services uh, that outlines a, a range of student services. And I'm going to be talking about some of those um, that, that are there to, to support students. Okay, if we can go to the next slide. Um, one, one thing for students, I think, that are particularly starting right now, particularly if they don't come uh, if they aren't coming to a physical campus or uh, if they're coming to a physical campus but noticing that, uh, that certain buildings are, are locked or closed um, is, is that there may not be that physical reminder that these services are there and available to them. Um, and, and so I think it's important to, to remind students that, that those services are still there even if, if physical buildings are closed or even if, if the, um, those, phys those services aren't accessed in person, uh, that, that they are available through a simple phone call um, or email in some cases. Uh, and so ways to access services can all be found um, online um, and, and uh, uh, and I'll, I'll be going into some of those those uh, kind of examples of those services, but 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 uh, th there there's a wealth of resources and supports and people that are waiting to support students, um, uh, and it's helpful to get that reminder when when we don't have that physical reminder we would sometimes have in in different times. Okay, next next slide. So one, one support that the BCIT and strategy we have to, to try and catch some of those students who would fall through the cracks, maybe because they aren't reaching out for support uh, uh, or, or maybe they are, but is, is what we call our early assist program. And uh, early assist at, at that website link kind of noted below bcit.ca slash early assist, anybody, any member of our community uh, can submit an early assist request if they identify a student who may need help. Uh, so that includes the student themselves, uh, that includes a classmate of the student, that includes instructors, um, anybody who, who identifies that there's a student who may, they maybe have some concerns about or might need some help can submit an early assist uh, report. And all that means is that uh, a, a case manager from the student life office will check in with that student. That's really all that means. Uh, so, um, and it doesn't show up on a student's academic record. Uh, it's, it's not kind of a, a punitive kind of process. It's really a supportive process. So all that means is that the student would receive a supportive check-in uh, from a case manager in, in the student life office and and it's a, a confidential platform so information that's submitted in would be held in the student life office and wouldn't be shared with the academic program unless um, the student was needing some support coordinating with the academic program about um, the supports for them related to something. Uh, a couple things that it's not, it's not for emergencies. So, um, you know, certainly call 911 if, 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 um, if there's an emergency, uh, it may take a day or two kind of for, for a response to happen. So it's not designed to be an emergency uh, response. Uh, and it's also not for conduct violations. Uh, and a student cannot get in trouble through early assist. Uh, and we'll, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so I mentioned just anyone can support, uh, submit the early assist referral and then, and then somebody will reach out. And then it's really up to the student to decide. So somebody else might have submitted because they were concerned about the student, but the student might decide that they're fine and, and that's okay. Kind of it would be left there. Uh, but what the early assist process does is it, uh, it helps students navigate resources Kind of at, at BCIT because it can often be hard for a student on their own to navigate what resources are available and what they might need and what the best fit might be. Uh, so it, it provides them with a little bit of a navigator uh, in supporting them and connecting with the resources that they might need um, kind of depending on their situation. Uh, and we have seen many instances where it really does help to prevent students who, who need support from falling through the cracks. Um, so that, that's one, one support we have available and system that, that we have available that that's, uh, can be helpful for students to know about because they can submit that, you know, that's a great way for them to connect with help if they're not sure where, where to go, uh, but also um, others can identify a student that, that may need support. Uh, so what are some of those services that early assist might refer into? If we go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about counseling and student health, counseling and student development and student health services. So we can go one more slide. Okay. 
Uh, so BCIT uh, does have student health services, which is a team of, of doctors and nurses and a psychiatrist that's available for students. The psychiatrist, you need a referral uh, from a GP, just, just like um, other specialty uh, doctors. Um, common uh, problems that students present with uh, at student health include mental health. Uh, that's, that's one of the top um, areas, sexual health, immunizations, general medical procedures and, and concerns um, are, are common. So students can really use student health services like, uh, like they would any walk-in clinic or, or, or GP office and can call uh, to, to book an appointment. Uh, there's often very little wait list. And one of the nice things is that our GPs um, are not, uh, don't bill MSP directly. Uh, and so what that means is they, they often tend to spend a little bit more time with students than you might experience at an average, um, just your average walk-in clinic uh, and, and see part of their role is educating students about how to use the health system and about their own health. And so students often appreciate having that experience with, with our uh, with our doctors and, and our psychiatrists with the referral students are able to get in with about, about a, right now there's about a three week wait, which is pretty incredible for a psychiatrist uh, um, uh, wait time. So that, that's, that's kind of something that we're lucky to, to have um, as well. Now, right now during COVID, uh, we, uh, our doctors are seeing people by phone or virtual appointment first uh, with a follow-up in-person visit possible if if it's determined that that's required. So that's kind of how we're we're working with that right now. And what we're finding is a lot of things can be handled um, purely by phone or virtual visit. Uh, but if if a in-person visit is required, kind of needed, then they would bring the person in after doing uh, some screening procedures there. So that's how that's being conducted with student health services. Uh, counseling and student development um, offers confidential and free counseling to all students at BCIT. Um, there's often uh, a very low wait list time that we're kind of fortunate to have. I, I think right now, and this is kind of one of our peak times, we have about a week wait until our first available appointment. Uh, and that's all uh, provided by master's level uh, clinical counselors. <laughs> 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 uh, and just some of the common cons concerns that students present with include anxiety, stress, depression, relationships, and, and loss. So certainly would encourage students to take advantage of, of that um, during their time at BCIT if that's something that could be um, of support for them. Right now, uh, all of the, um, the counseling appointments are being provided by uh, a kind of virtual or phone-based appointment with our counselors. So we're not providing in-person counseling at this time, uh, but hope to get back to that as, as soon as, as, as kind of as was safe to do so, but, but currently just phone and, and virtual counseling appointments. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about accessibility services. Um, uh, many of you, or mo all of you, probably work with students who, uh, who have a disability or qualify for um, for accommodations, educational accommodations. Uh, we, we call those plans individual accommodations plans. I think you usually call them individual education plans. Um, but our accessibility services team includes vocational rehabilitation specialists uh, that will help a student develop an accommodation plan if, if they uh, present appropriate medical documentation. Uh, and a student's instructor will not be informed about the nature of the health condition, only about the nature of the accommodation that, that's required. Um, and that doesn't show up on a student's transcript um, or form a part of their academic record in any way. Uh, and, and you can see the, the website information just there for students to learn more about how to access accessibility services, just bcit.ca forward slash accessibility. We'll go to the next slide. I think the message that we would really want to get out, I think the, the main message um, is just for students to contact accessibility services as soon as possible. Uh, some accommodations do take time to implement. And so uh, if, if a student approaches accessibility services later in the process, sometimes wanting an accommodation for midterms and coming in a week before midterms, it may be too late to uh, develop the accommodation plan and implement it in time 
to, to support them. So really, the sooner that they're able to connect with accessibility services um, upon registering in a program, the, the better. Uh, they do need to submit uh, medical documentation in order to book an intake appointment. And that was just because we found that when we weren't requiring that, a lot of students had their intake appointment when they weren't ready to be supported yet. So it, it um, we found that it just made the most sense to ensure that they had their medical documentation uh, submitted before booking an intake appointment with the VRS to, to go over their situation and to start to develop that accommodation plan. Um, and we do hear from educators that that's the uh, in high schools that they definitely find that that uh, there's a greater expectation on the student in post secondary in terms of taking the initiative. Um, the students are expected to play a more active role and to initiate uh, that request for accommodations in in post secondary. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, that's just a little bit about how to get in touch with accessibility services. Uh, so we'll keep going. Okay, so there, there are a, a range of other services uh, that, that I won't have time to go into depth or detail with, uh, but, but certainly we feel very lucky and fortunate to have our, our team at Indigenous uh, Services, now called Indigenous Initiatives and Partnerships, uh, that really uh, kind of to, to create a, um, a very safe and welcoming kind of home base for, um, uh, for Indigenous students and other students who, who, who may kind of value those, those supports. Uh, we mentioned kind of financial distress uh, kind of being an area for students. So student financial aid and awards, students just being aware of what um, financial aid um, may be available to them um, kind of is, is, is pretty important for, for students and, the, and there often tend to be bursaries that can be available for, for students. Um, and I've mentioned some of the others. Rec services, uh, currently our recreational facilities are, are closed, but there are some online virtual fitness classes and other things at the moment. When it opens up again, we have some beautiful rec facilities um, for students to take advantage of just to stay active uh, be, because um, yeah, staying active and having exercise is important to, to well-being. Okay, we'll, we'll keep going there. Um, maybe another thing I would just briefly mention with other services, uh, before going on, uh, peer tutoring is available for our learning commons that can be a really fantastic resource for students. Uh, group based uh, peer tutoring is usually free of charge. Uh, and then there's a, a fairly reasonable fee for individual tutoring uh, that could be really worth it for students who are needing a little bit of extra support um, uh, in a program. So it's definitely something for students to, to keep in mind. Um, and, and also our, our library has some great live chat supports available through askaway.org. That's askaway.org. Uh, you can chat and receive uh, uh, kind of research and resource help through the, through the library. Uh, and the other thing I would just maybe highlight is all of the students are directed to the new student success hub that uh, that offers uh, kind of just more information about all of these resources. So I'm just going to put uh, a link to that student or, or where students go to get that. Uh, you Students would need a, a kind of a, their, their student ID and password to get to this. So, so you wouldn't be able to kind of get in probably as high school educators. It'd be neat, actually interesting for us to see if there's a way to, get, to give you a preview of that. Um, that's something I could take away as a to-do for myself, but, but we go into the learning hub uh, and then visit the student success hub kind of at that link uh, and then they get more information and introduction to all those resources. So uh, just, just kind of to, to, I know we're running a little bit behind, so I'm going to try and wrap up kind of fairly briefly here. Just wanted to touch base on BCIT policies, rights and procedures. This is really my colleague Robin Bennett's uh, area, but what I thought might be interesting to you from a health, uh, from a high school educator perspective uh, is just that uh, you're likely having some of these conversations with your students. And if you are, uh, you're preparing them well uh, not only for post-secondary, but also for the workplace. And so maybe it's just a little affirmation and encouragement to all of you uh, that these conversations do matter. Um, so I'll just briefly go over a couple of policies. Uh, there is a student code of conduct policy, non-academic, uh, uh, and I'll just read this. BCIT is committed to providing an environment that fosters learning where respect, diversity, civility, and inclusiveness are valued. Students are expected to conduct themselves in a manner consistent with these values. 
Um, so that and that the conduct policy kind of uh, uh, kind of pertains to a range of, of behaviors, including uh, potential fraudulent representation, uh, disruption to the learning environment, any abusive or threatening acts, um, theft or damage, uh, any crim criminal acts. Uh, and there's also safety and security policy uh, and procedures. All members of the BCIT community and visitors are responsible for conducting themselves in a manner that does not endanger themselves or others or pose a risk to institute facilities, equipment, or um, other physical assets or other uh, person, person's property. Uh, and so if we go to the next side, we get into a little bit more around the policy about creating this inclusive uh, learning environment. We have BCIT's harassment and discrimination policy that applies to all students' employees. Um, and BCIT will not tolerate any discrimination, bullying or harassing behavior, which undermines the dignity, self-esteem and productivity of any student or employee. Uh, so d discrimination refers to, to, to kind of uh, adverse treatment related to protected characteristics um, and personal har harassment may include just demeaning uh, or abusive behavior towards, towards an individual. And we also have BCIT sexual violence and misconduct policy. Uh, and BCIT does not tolerate any form of sexual violence and misconduct and BCIT is committed to providing and maintaining a safe and secure learning and working environment free from sexual violence and misconduct. So I think it's important for students to know uh, one, that they have protections at BCIT and, and that no one has to, to tolerate um, uh, any uh, any behavior or situation that they feel is a danger or threat to, to themselves, uh, and also that these expectations exist here. Uh, and that when you're when you're preparing students to contribute to an inclusive and safe um, uh, environment, whether it's a learning environment or work environment, you're preparing them well for uh, for their post secondary education, and you're also pre preparing them well for a workplace because being able to contribute to an inclusive uh, and safe environment uh, is is a valuable skill to have in in work as well. Uh, so we have a lot of programs uh, on the go at BCIT. We have a bystander uh, program that, that is part of training to pre uh, prevent gender-based uh, violence. Uh, our BCIT Student Association does some great work with consent training. Um, and, and I would imagine that, that you also are having some conversations with your students related to some of these issues um, in school. And, and if you are, we really appreciate that. And it, it's helping to prepare them uh, here, uh, a couple other things maybe we, we found just are, are helpful messages or, or reminders uh, for students. Uh, one is that these policies apply to to in-person activities, but they also apply to online uh, activities that are related to to their uh, their learning at BCIT and their activities at BCIT. And so, uh, so students have to all also take that in mind that that uh, that kind of what they. Uh, what they say online can can also matter and can can sometimes apply to, to this um, and and that some of these behaviors if it's discrimination harassment or gender-based violence can also sometimes take the form of jokes uh, but jokes are no excuse for for demeaning behavior and, and so uh, and so it, it's important to also be really careful kind of around that um, um, as well um, so anyways, just yeah, wanted to let, let you know that, that your efforts kind of related to, to some of these issues are appreciated as well, just in preparing students. And I think that's the, the end of what I had to say. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, and if you do have questions, uh, my email address is there as well as my phone number. So you're, you're welcome to reach out and I'd be happy to, to have a dialogue with you. Hello, everybody. I'm Carol Martina. I'm the High School Partnership Coordinator, and I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of some of our high school partnerships and highlight a few of our current programs that we're working on. Historically, BCIT has been involved with high school partnerships since the 1990s, and we partner with school districts around the Lower Mainland, but also other parts of the province, including uh, the Lower Mainland and the Southern Interior. Next slide. S yeah, so um, we usually divide or historically we've divided our partnerships into three program areas or categories, trades, technical and technology. But in reality, technology really isn't embedded in everything that we do in every career pathway and education pathway at BCIT. 
We, of course, are known for our hands-on learning style. And all of our dual credit partnerships and initiatives incorporate, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, sorry, incorporate um, personalized learning and career exploration, which aligns with the K-12 curriculum redesign. And um, in addition, it also helps expose high school students to post-secondary learning environment and helps to make that transition from secondary and post-secondary a little bit easier. Now, the COVID uh, pa uh, pandemic, of course, has affected how we deliver our programs. And Sonia and Carol, uh, Caroline went and explained quite a bit on how that is working now at BCIT. So next slide, please. I wanted to just highlight a few of our programs. And the first one I want to talk about is TEALS, which is technology, education, li and literacy in high schools. It is a partnership with Microsoft and BCIT was the first um, post-secondary to partner with TEALS in Canada. So we are working closely with them to adapt the curriculum to Canadianize it, so to speak. Because of the pandemic, the computer industry professionals that would normally go into the classrooms and partner with teachers, they're not allowed to do that this year, but we're still continuing to work with TEALS and we're actually working on a virtual event now uh, during the Hour of Coding Week, which will happen in December. Next slide. Another new uh, program that I'm very excited about and that I worked very closely with Sonia on is the Aviation Explorer. This is a brand new partnership with the Surrey School District. It's going to have a co-delivery model. So uh, ground school courses will be taught at the high school with a high school teacher who also is a helicopter pilot. And then the students will be brought to the Richmond Aerospace Campus for some hands-on exploration and learning at our campus. So that's a pretty exciting project. Uh, next slide. We also have another brand new program with our School of Business and Media. It's a high school pilot program that will, um, that will, uh, sorry, allow students to explore an array of options for students in grade 12, 10 to 12 to explore business and media careers. Options include our School of Business faculty visiting the classrooms virtually to talk about careers, specific industries, and uh, business um, and design programs. We'll also be offering a career exploration program, which includes students being able to access personnel style indicators and job testing indicators. And then that program will lead into the Explorer program where the students can actually uh, sample business classes online. And this November, we're also relaunching our business case study competition in virtual format. And the upside of it being virtual this year is that we will be able to expand it to more students and more school districts. So next slide. So moving on to our dual credits programs, we have about 250 high school students annually as dual credit students at BCIT. These are grade 11 and 12 students. We have several delivery models, including that the students can come to BCIT we reserve a seat for them in a regular fee pair intake and they attend the BCIT campus. We also have delivery models where it is taught both at the high school with a high school teacher and then the students come to BCIT for a set number of weeks. So examples of that program are carpentry framing with Coquitlam and New West District. We also have a piping partnership and a metal partnership in, um, with Maple Ridge that works that way. We also have satellite high school programs, including our electrical foundation program, where our BCIT faculty actually teach at a high school location. And we have that program in Surrey, Maple Ridge, Langley, Delta, and Kelowna. But no matter what model the students do, the successful students will receive high school seats, BCIT's credentials, and um, also other level one from the industry training authority. Next slide. So our partnerships vary district from district. So you should contact your school district career coordinator for specific partnerships with your district. And you can also contact myself or Emma Caldecott. Emma is our high school dual credits admissions officer. She brings a wealth of information to this role. So we're very lucky to have her. 
And I also just want to do a shout out for the CES conference, which will be virtual this year. That's the Career Education Society Conference. And that's for educators interested in uh, career education. And you can still register so you can look online. So um, I understand there might be some issues with my microphone. So um, anyways, I'm sorry about that. Anyway, I am. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. A couple of quick references that I want to mention before we go on to questions and answers. Um, I thank you everyone for your time and your patience as we move through uh, the presentations and especially thankful to the presenters. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and your uh, energetic and passionate uh, discussion points today. Um, we do want to make sure that we suggest that we encourage students uh, to attend online information sessions that are taking place uh, presently. Um, there have been some great information sessions that have happened that have been involved with, with health sciences, um, school of business is having them uh, from the uh, aerospace campus uh, training programs. Um, all of the program areas from BCIT are, are pushing these information sessions. And it's a great way to connect with the, the program instructors and the key staff members. Um, so as well, it's important to take a moment to check out bcit.ca forward slash experience. Um, for additional details on what's happening at BCIT presently. And as well, we want to make sure that we continue to connect. Um, there's lots of ways through social media, um, but I definitely strive to push for YouTube specifically, um, as there's a lot of great clips and a lot of them are very sp program specific. As well, the, the BCIT's counselor guide is a great resource and I encourage you all to check it out. Um, as well, we want to make sure that we plug uh, PSBC um, because there are events continuously going on uh, where you can connect with advisors or your students can. Um, and so either whether it be on the PSBC virtual uh, site or to specifically sit down and, and uh, have your students uh, view a, a video session uh, with us virtually. And of course, as always, BCIT, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter on the social media side of things. And uh, the, the, I've got a link in here specific to bcit.ca forward slash counselors guide, because uh, that's got a lot of important reference as well. And then of course, if you do need to reach out to us in program advising, um, you can uh, make contact with us directly, uh, contact our main line and have our, uh, the assistant that works with us uh, connect you to us. Um, the BCIT general email is program underscore advising at bcit.ca. And we would strive to answer questions specific to admissions, the application process, uh, resources for your students, as well as success, stra success strategies, program schedules, and many other details as well. And with that, I'd like to shift over. Um, I'll just quickly comment that there is a follow-up survey that will be sent out to each attendee for feedback. Um, that can be quite important. And I, as well, I want to extend and say thank you as well to all the presenters, uh, my colleagues, and the marketing team that was uh, helpful in making sure that the event was successful today. If you do have any questions, uh, we can encourage you to either type them into the chat and then we can either read them aloud and answer them audibly, um, or you could also raise your hand uh, in the participants list and then we can try and uh, click on to you so you can ask your question audibly that way. I believe most of my colleagues are still here and present. Um, so if there's anything you'd like to ask, go ahead and pose it to us right now. Any questions? Oh, here we go. So Dane has asked, uh, would you recommend technology entry for any student who does not have the prerequisites for other BCIT programs, or is this program for a specific path? So to answer your question, because technology entry does include uh, both math, English, as well as uh, physics and chemistry, it tends to be more aligned with programs that have those types of requirements. However, it is accessed by students that do proceed towards programs such as computer system technology or computer information technology, which are simply math and English specific. Um, so it, it is an option. It just means that their focus will be spread out over the four segments that they'd be involved in, uh, the two sciences and then the English and the math. Um, so it's, it's entirely up to the individual student, but they may want to, if they're pursuing a program from the school business or something from computing that only has English and math, they may choose to simply attend individual upgrading courses specific to those uh, to ensure they have a strong result. 
Uh, Rochelle David has asked, can a student defer their admissions if they're accepted into a program? I don't know if Lexi wants to respond to this or I can go ahead and respond as per my knowledge of it. Um, but my understanding is the admissions department would usually permit a student to defer their um, acceptance. So if a student were to accept, be accepted to a, a program that had an early intake, let's say they've applied to uh, carpentry um, and they've, they've applied recently. So they would have the ability to say, well, you've accepted me for April, but I won't complete my high school graduation until the end of June. Um, could, uh, could I please defer my application until a later intake date? And that's usually something that the admission department would be able to accommodate from my understanding. And Jesse, let me chime in a little bit. If, you're, if your student has been accepted into a full-time technology program, then unfortunately they have to withdraw their acceptance and apply for the next year because entrance requirements may change year by year for these technology programs. But for Trace is kind of flexible, then I would recommend them to get in touch with our admissions team using email or phone admissions at bcit.ca if they prefer email. Thank you. Thanks, Lexi. And, and my colleague Zara had also commented uh, further to the previous question with respect to upgrading for um, a school of business program that they do have specific uh, upgrading courses for their the math uh, involved. And that's usually outlined on the program page um, or oftentimes you'll find a link below the requirements that says read more about how to meet BCIT's entrance requirements, which has an assessment testing section as well as upgrading section uh, that would reference those uh, specific upgrading courses. Um, and I think it looks like if I'm not mistaken, if I haven't missed a question here, Jay Towers is asking Carol specifically, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, could you please repeat the names of the high school connection programs um, and t what TEAL stands for? Um, looks like that's from Jen. Carol, I don't know if you could chime in on that really quickly. Oh. Yeah, I will put it in the chat. There we go. Thank you. And. Janice is making a comment as well. Yeah, spend a day is currently suspended. Um, so you could always check back to the website periodically, um, but certainly I don't think it's something that's gonna be returned to be available, similar to, to having campus tours um, until uh, things have eased up with respect to uh, COVID-19. Um, and Marika is asking further about the CES conference. Um, was that, that was on your slide as well, Carol, right? Um, I'll send the link. Okay, perfect. Thank you. It looks like Emma's included in the chat. That's perfect. Um, make sure if I scroll to the bottom. I can't even tell if I'm scrolled to the bottom here. Are there any other questions from anyone? I haven't. I'm not sure if I've seen any hands raised for people to ask questions audibly. Um, oh, Jen again. Uh, so Jen's asking, I have some students who would be interested in, in a school program not offered in our district. Is there any way to connect them to it? And I think I'm assuming, Jen, you're referring to something through Carol as well, through the high school partnerships. We can clarify that. So I imagine uh, with, if it is connected to the high school partnerships that Carol would suggest connecting with uh, the the individual within your district um, to see what can be arranged in that way. And if necessary, they'll connect with Carol as well. Um, Sanju's asked, can students apply for the trades while they're in grade 11? There, there should be the opportunity for students to apply while they're in grade 11 for the trades programs. Um, sometimes timing can be an aspect to keep in mind. So determining when they would be ready to get involved in the trade. So if it happens to be a trade that has a longer wait list, as for some of the ones I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, say for instance, airport operations or uh, HVAC for the diploma, um, they should have the opportunity to apply while they're in grade 11 and satisfy the requirements either through testing or through proof with their grade 11 marks. Um, however, again, like I said, it would we'd want to make sure that, the, that there is a longer wait list so that we're we're trying to accommodate them as per their graduation from high school. So. Um, and 
Deborah's chimed in referencing great information at the experience page, video of the 360 highlight tour from the learning spaces, which is great. Make sure I didn't miss any questions here. We've got that one covered. Any other questions that people have brought up here? Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Otherwise, we definitely appreciate everyone's attendance today. I know we ran a little bit long, um, but uh, we'll try and answer any questions that you have after the fact. Um, but it's been a great session uh, for me today, and I appreciate everyone that was able to come in and attend. Thanks very much, everyone.